Hello from Fiji, Bula. This um, will be occasion uh, in English language because I have so many friends who um, cannot speak German and um, so I will do an uh, English session today and I have to say before a big story. <laughs> I learned my English on the street, so to say. I didn't like it in the school. And um, my accent is very present and I hope you understand me. I will also read something of my um, out of my English translated books. And um, yeah, so um, I want to tell you today why I'm sitting in Fiji. Um, I'm sitting here, you see. It's very warm today, for hot, over 30 degrees. It's raining, it's uh, summer season, tropical. This island, Taviuni, it's called uh, the Garden Island because it's raining so much. And um, same time, it's very hot. <laughs> yeah, but after a few years, you can adapt to it. Yeah. So, um, when I was very young, even a small child, I have always uh, in my mind and even in my visions um, an island uh, of perfect happiness. I know it in my heart, there is an island in the South Pacific that is just about happiness. I was completely sure. Sure, it was very crazy. So I began to read books about islands. I read the book about Mounty, uh, Bounty and Captain Blight <laughs> and I thought oh, maybe he was around there <laughs> and um, but no I read about it no 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 it could be not the island um, I was dreaming and feeling of so I go to um, in the school at this time you have huge maps in the school even map rooms so I look at the maps and I saw, thought when I see the, the structure of the island I will immediately realize um, um, the island no, it's also not working. So when I was um, 15, teenager, I got in the movie The Blue Lagoon, you know, and I was really just there. I thought maybe this is an island. <laughs> but I saw the movie and I realized, no, it's not about the island that I'm looking for. But what is interesting, it's the island I'm speaking to you now. It's Taviuni. Uh, some parts of it were recorded here. <laughs> so I was already nearby. <laughs> Anyway, so I have to let go all of these visions, um, all of my feeling, and um, but I still was waiting for it. So, and then a moment was coming in my life. I was thirty years old, um, and um, I at the time before I was four. You can say I was looking everywhere for the truth. Um, I was not interested in anything about life, to be honest, or about some career, or about education, about all of this. So I have read, um, when I was about 60, 70, I began to read a lot about philosophy, also European philosopher, um, also about very, very old traditions who exist before, uh, you can say before the more man-dominated culture came up. Um, so I, I, I read everything. Uh, Nietzsche, Camus, Sartre, Schopenhauer, um, everything. <laughs> but nobody could give me, um, yeah, even a sign what truth is. And um, so with, um, at the age of 22, um, I was so uh, frustrated about the westernized life that I left for uh, India without any plan. And uh, when I was there, I sit uh, in temples, in ashrams, in meditation center, meditating, you can say, 18, 20 hours every day. And I did it for a few months and at one point I was sitting in front of a cave at the Shiva 
holy Shiva place in the middle of India, Maharashtra, Shiva Mundi called. And after sitting there for many, many hours, I realized, shit, <laughs> nothing has changed. <laughs> it's still the same. So I go back to Germany. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I still was uh, very much attracted to meditation. And I did it every day until now. And uh, I live a very disciplined life. Um, but I still not finding the perfect truth. I know what I did. I did some Buddhist practice. I did also read about Hindu tradition, Vedanta, and about shamanism, all of this. And I did it fully. Um, and um, But I always realized something is not right. There's not the perfect understanding <laughs> of reality. I couldn't explain what it was, but s always something left back who was completely not satisfied. What I was practicing, what comes up, what I recognize, it was never yeah, perfect. So this was a moment when um, the reading now is starting. I was 30 years old. And um, I wrote um, a book about my journey, about my adventure. Uh, first in German, 2008. It's called um, Und die Wahrheit steht auf. And was later, five years later, translated. Um, and has a title, And the Heart is Mine. A Graceful Life with Avatar Adida. So it's my book about my first, you can say, um, 10 years in my life before with Avatar Adida. Yeah. And um, what is really a secret uh, in itself, when the book was printed on this day, Adida left his body. This was 2008, November 27th. So, okay. So I start. It, it is a prologue that, 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 that I'm reading now to you. And I hope it works with this um, laptop here, <laughs> because I have no outprint. Okay. <coughs> so it's a prologue of the book, um, And the Heart is Mine. Graceful Life is Avatar Adida. In 1994, on November 22. Something happened in my life that went far beyond any kind of expectation that my life so far had presented me with. Two weeks before this date, I was walking in the streets of Freiburg, a city in south of Germany, just doing some errands. I had recently started training as a psychotherapist finally finding some peace in my desperate and extreme search for the truth with experience of my early childhood. This constant sense of being driven, the compulsive urge to want the world to be different than it was, the desire to run away from the challenges of daily life, all of this seemed to have exhausted itself. Deeply separate and deflated, I was starting blankly at the Bertholdsbrunnen, the central fountain of the university city of Freiburg. In one corner, near the goblet square that surrounded the fountain, there was an electrical box that, as always, was covered with a meridian of event posters, an announcement of all kinds, colors, and sizes. One of those posters, I read the name Adida, introducing a talk about the teachings of wisdom of the master, topic death and dying. A voice inside me said, 
Petrus, don't be intolerant. A spiritual master, you are going to check this out. I read the name Adida again and again. Adida, Adida, Adida. His name just wouldn't leave me during the remaining days leading up to the event. The evening of November 22, I found myself in the lecture hall of the old university. The room was filled with the 30 of to 40 people in the audience. At the very front was a large image of Adida. There was a smell of incense and flowers decorated the table on which his picture was standing. The lecture started and I listened to the words of the speaker. His reading from the scriptures and instructions of the master. What was conveyed in this lecture? was more than astonishing. The words were charged with so much power. The longer I listened, the more I was overwhelmed with an attraction and a deep feeling of truth and grandness. This exceeded everything I had ever experienced in my life, in my endless search. Then doubts began to encroach. What I was hearing couldn't possibly be true. This couldn't be the place where the deepest truth was revealed about our existence out of nothingness. Not there in this very simple, ordinary little German town, so totally without any extravagance or adventure far away from any holy place and what's more without the actual bodily presence of the master himself but the power of the words of adida surrounded everywhere in my entire being as truth and spread out to such an extent that it felt like the entire world existed in it my mind couldn't grab hold of it anymore. It was so much bigger. The lecture was coming to an end. Many of those present were very churned up inside. Some were angry, arguing heatedly in the mood to fight. Others were silent and thoughtful. I just sat there not comprehending anything anymore. As a conclusion, there was a video presentation in which Adida was giving darshan. He was sitting in a chair, as he usually does, and the people present were gazing at him silently. The room was completely darkened, his image appeared on the screen. At this moment, my perception of space and time disappeared. My body felt like a thunder went through it. Everything around me began to vibrate in a kind of fire. My heart shattered and was lost. A feeling of infinite and eternal love rushed into my body from above, yes, into my entire life, like a waterfall that had only been waiting for this moment and this opportunity.
In front of me sat God, incarnate. The truth, the eternal, limitless, unconditional love that I had been looking for incessantly and desperately, life after life. The prophesied figure of the God-man. My heart just knew it. Could it be here in Freiburg now? It was unearthly. That which has no name sat in front of me, in human form and shape. At that moment I fell into this infinite love. I couldn't grab hold of myself anymore. I couldn't think. It was as if lightning flashes of love were chasing through my body and each lightning flashed, confirmed, said the truth, the reality as such has assumed a human form in front of my eyes. The event came to an end. Without words and completely churned up inside, I bought a book in German language, which contained translated excerpts of the Dornhorst Testament. I immediately began to read it while slowly leaving the room. Ahamda Asmi, beloved, I am Da. I had to read it again and again. It was just not comprehensible. Outside, it had begun to rain. The city lights reflected off the wet clopstones. Everything shone and glittered a thousand times. My friend Julia was coming toward me on the sidewalk. I still couldn't stop reading. She looked at me. Your eyes are look like fireballs. What happened? I could hardly speak. It's just too incredible, too overwhelming. I can't talk about it right now. Over the next days and weeks, I dreamed of Adida every night. Upon waking, I felt his presence around me all the time. The the whole room was full of his presence. He was with me now literally at all times. Every night, I now wandered with him through different spaces and different times. In the dreams, Adida appeared younger. He laughed consciously, etched me on to go further. He asked questions and told me so many things about the peculiarity of these dream places. Very often these places were just mere stones and ruins, broken down temples, stone desert, rocks, mountains, places that clearly have had a life in the past or perhaps in the future. This way of being with Adida was very exhausting for me. After about two weeks, I knew that I (coughs) shall never be without him again, not even one second of my life, and that I shall never forget his name again. He only laughed and made friendly jokes about me, who gave so much importance to all of this. I kept going on as usual with my work in the health food store, but I continued thinking of him at all times, about his power, his overwhelming love, the truth that he executes and that he represents with utter perfection. My life was totally taken by his presence. One day I was walking working alone in the store 
when the shelves began to gradually emanate a radiant light and there was a loud voice that suddenly manifest itself in the spade out of nothing. How much longer do you actually want to spend your time like this? That was just too much. <laughs> I was shaken to the bone, totally shocked and afraid. Now I saw with certainty that this encounter with Adida would ruin my entire life, all my cherished experience. It was just too dangerous. I didn't want to dream anymore or to feel or to read anymore. I panicked and showed Adida away, quiet, distance. One month later in January, I traveled to Munich. The next stage of my education, Hakomi, a body-oriented psychotherapy, was on the schedule. In the group room of the seminar house, my colleagues were already gathered. The head of the department had partially emptied her library and her books were piled up in stacks in the room. I walked down the two stairs into the room, stumbled on the last step and fell head first into the middle of the room and right into the stacks of the books. I lay there flat on my belly, under me the books, my face on the floor. <coughs> Perplexed by the sudden fall, I slowly got up. Under my chest was a book with young Adida on the cover. It was his autobiography, The Knee of Listening. I saw his picture and in that same instant I gave up. My resistance was broken. I understood and accepted his gift. I wanted to be his devotee. I wanted to be with him, never again without him. The search had lasted too long, life after life. One drama pelt on top of the other, the truth nowhere to be found, the happiness never perfect, always a remnant of dissatisfaction hidden in a secret corner of the heart, which then snowballed into new heroics and new adventures and into more despair and further searching. I have never actively searched for Adida. I had always hoped for him, but never really expected to find him. His appearance and his revelation have not the slightest connection with space and time. Also, even against the background of the deepest spiritual and mystical experience, he has nothing in common with our way of seeing the world. His loga and his revelation of the reality go far beyond any of that. Happiness had finally found me and everything that I have experienced and lived before was reduced to absurdity. So, this is the introduction um, to my book, and the heart is mine, and um, just to make my first words of this session round, um, after a while I heard uh, that Avatar Dida 
is living on an island <laughs> in the South Pacific. And uh, very mysterious. And um, the name of the island um, is Naitamba. It is the most beautiful, most powerful, most demanding place on Earth, maybe even in the cosmic domain. I have no idea. So even Adida have left his body now um, 30 years ago. Uh, his transcendental spiritual presence is there. And uh, there's nothing greater as to live there and to be his devotee. <laughs> <laughs> 